There's always been makeup effects in one way or the other. Every time you see a, a trick of some sort on the screen, like a monster, somebody had to design it, make it up, make it work. And throughout the years, uh, it's evolved along the cinema. Creative people like to go beyond the real into the surreal and into the imaginative. When you go beyond the real world and show an audience something beyond what they can imagine, that's a pretty exciting and fantastic thing. There is an enormous power of a human being in a mask, and it goes way back into our ancient history, because the humanity is in there, but you can't quite tell what it's feeling, and it has the shield against you. I mean, if you can find something that, where well, you look in the mirror and you go, ah, that's it. You know, I mean, that's the beauty of prosthetics. Growing up, I was obsessed with makeup effects. And in fact, I remember at my bar mitzvah, I was sawed in half with a chainsaw. Strike terror, Lord. You know, I think a lot of people don't think about the fact that when you watch mainstream movies, there are makeup effects peppered throughout a, a, a lot of those films. You have uh, something as simple as out-of-the-kit makeups. You have prosthetics that can either age someone, make them fat, make them look like a creature. Uh, then you also get into a whole other aspect, which is fake bodies, animatronics, puppetry, uh, fake animals. A fake beagle from Underdog. We've done everything from uh, bodies being electrocuted in the Green Mile to uh, a fat suit on Mike Myers for Austin Powers. So every single film offers a different challenge and a new challenge. I've been friends with Richard Taylor from Weta forever. And when they were doing Lord of the Rings, I'd go and visit. And they were so like immersed in that world. You know, what, what happened was Richard Taylor had been approached about doing Narnia. He was in the middle of King Kong and he said, listen, you should call K&B, talk to Howard, talk to Greg. Those guys would certainly be up for the challenge, if nothing else. We had six months to prep and I was off with the crew to New Zealand for nine months. Narnia, we were responsible for building an army, actually two armies of warring creatures. And I'll tell you, I've worked on a lot of big projects in the 25 years I've done this, and nothing has been as big as Narnia, nothing. You deal with a movie like Chronicles of Narnia, and there's 100 people in fawn makeup, centaur makeup, satyr makeup. It was such a daunting, overwhelming task. The genius of great makeup, obviously, is you don't really, you can't really tell. I mean, my wife would come to set and like get really close to me and stare at it like she had never, like she was looking at me for the first time, because you don't know where it stops and where I start. You really start to enter that Narnian world, that fantasy world, when you start putting on this armor and this makeup. We had cast James really late in the game, which was making me nervous. I needed so I needed X amount of time to get James's makeup and designed out and on. So I was terrified. Like I was losing sleep up until that point. It was the very first thing we shot was Mr. Tumnus for us. But finally, once Andrew said, that's it, we nailed it, I was like, oh, thank goodness. Do you mean to say that you're a daughter of Eve? My mum's name is Helen. Did, yes, but you are, in fact, human. You know, you shoot for nine months, it's sort of more commonplace to see somebody in makeup than see somebody not in makeup. But it is funny being in the middle of a field in the Czech Republic with all these guys with, like, centaur hoods on and they lift it up and they start smoking and it's very Fellini-esque. I have three kids and they love the books and they were just excited the fact that I got called in to do this. That was really cool because up until this point there's nothing they could see that I've worked on at all. Which is kind of sad when you're you know, proud of the work you're doing but you really can't. Sorry guys, you can't go see Hostel. The animals in Narnia just captured my heart. You know, and for, for that to transcend that bridge of reality for us so that we can relate to it on a heart level as another entity is, I think, amazing. From that, of course, nominations for the BAFTAs and for the Oscars and, and where all that led, it, it just was the best experience I could ever wish for.
I really enjoy working with Michael. He's great visionary, and I think that he's he's a demanding director, as every other director that I've ever worked with is. They want the best. The challenge with Michael Bay is that he likes to see as much stuff real in front of the camera as humanly possible. We actually made, I think, about 160 bodies on that movie, all told, from the room where there were all the bodies getting educated with all the different TV screens, and then there was the pod room where we had 40 different bodies in different stages of development. The idea really was, we're, you're growing human bodies. So we wanted to be able to see how these bodies were created from the inside out. And we had bodies that were literally just like a heart and a beating circulatory system in a human shape inside a sealed plastic bag filled with water. And we made partially clear intestines, hearts and things like that that we actually put inside that. So you, what you basically had was a completely see-through body. And then at the last minute, we had to actually add in some movement, which we couldn't quite figure out how to do that in a sealed plastic bag. But we uh, ran stuff through the umbilicals to make it look like they were sucking their thumbs and things like that. Everything had to be lit from below. You know, I mean, if it was just lit from above, you would have never seen any of the details. Like, we wanted everything to look translucent. The only way you can tell if it's translucent is if there's light shining through it. So we had these plastic bins with lights in them, and then we'd sit the bodies on them, and then we'd have to fill the plastic containers with water. So basically we're submerging them and then we'd bleed all the air out and then screw the caps on and with a tube suck the rest of the air out so that we didn't have bubbles in there. It was like giant breast implants with bodies inside of them. Transformers. What our assignment was on that was to uh, come up with the Frenzy Puppet which had six different names before we started doing it because the script was half top secret half the time. And we had to figure out a way how to make this computer designed puppet that when you design stuff on a computer, it's not really taking into account a lot of things for the real world. So there are parts that would fold in on itself that would just disappear in the design and in the animatics that we had to actually make function in real life. So we started talking about it, and I said, well, you know what? If this is a big CGI movie anyway, we could get a lot more life out of this puppet if we made it a rod puppet. So basically, you're, built, you're, you're taking rods out of the corners of the elbows, out of the back of the head, so that you have puppeteers in the shot that can actually get more dramatic movement and a larger range of movement. So when we got on set, Michael saw that. It, he instantly was like, wow, I can shoot, use this for a lot more shots, and I can shoot this, and I can shoot that, and I can do a lot more with it. And it gave him a tool. We had a remote control, cable-operated frenzy puppet, and they used it a lot in the film, and it's actually cut directly from CG shots to our puppet in there. Really, ultimately, our job is you got to provide the director with as, as many tools as you can. You know, the director's the, director's the painter, and you got to give him the paint and the brush, and then maybe if you got a palette knife, maybe if you have this, and all of a sudden, if you're giving the director more tools for him to do a better job, then he can paint a better picture. I know Darabont for years had been planning to do The Mist. He'd written the script, and it was on again, off again for at least 10, 15 years. Initially, the film was, was a higher-budgeted movie, but a lot of studio people were concerned about the end of the film, which was a very strong ending, a very bold ending, which a lot of people, myself included, respect Frank for sticking to his creative guns. This was a movie he wanted to make. And he finally got the chance to do it, but it was on a very limited budget. I mean, we shot that whole film in 36 days, that was part of the pleasure of this particular exercise for me. I set that as a goal as well, which is do it on an impossible schedule without benefit of enormous funds. Rather than pretending you're making a low-budget horror movie and spending a lot of money doing it, let's really make a low-budget horror movie. I love that it's got a 50s sensibility, and it feels very timeless, and yet it, it's supposed to take place today. Frank had always had the intention that it was going to be a heavy CGI movie, but that he wanted to augment with puppet pieces and, and have us design everything and build it, and then the visual effects people would take their cue off of what we were designing and building. We played with those ideas that, that the tentacles would unfurl and there'd be these little hooks, and the hooks would actually grab and pull the meat in, and then there's these little sea and enemy mouths that would chew on everything. The challenge where the effects were concerned, because the effects on that were a, a, a combination of some K&B practical stuff and a lot of really excellent 
CGI work from Cafe Effects. Uh, and, the, and the real challenge there was mesh the practical effects and the computer effects in a, in a happy way. <laughs> of my personal contributions to the mist, I think the most unusual contribution was I was what they called the green hand. They, they painted my hand green and they put ingenious uh, uh, little um, cable ties that they cut at angles. And my job was to, you know, simulate the tentacle coming in and then going right above the actor's chest, which had a big balloon of, of you know, blood. And I would grab it and pop it and pull all the flesh off and, and that got replaced with the CGI tentacle. Everyone knew that it was blood time when I showed up with a big green arm, you know, walking around and going, hey, blood today, huh, Shannon? Yeah, arm's green. That means we're gonna do some blood today. <laughs> And the CG's wonderful and the technology is fantastic and ever growing, but I think sometimes it's overused and where it's really good is where it just augments what, what, it, what already exists. I like the stuff in front of the camera. I like it in camera, which is becoming less used. Uh, I'm, I'm like one of those people who actually loves CGI. Uh, I, I think it's a great, great tool. I still do like animatronics. Um, but there's a fine line with it because it's, it's, it's capabilities are limited, you know. Um, you can't really have something flying down a supermarket aisle as an animatronic creature and have it really be believable. You're really much better off with computer graphics. Also, too, combining it with live action creature effects is the best of both worlds because actually when you make a monster, and it's in the room in front of the camera, it's undeniably there. And the audience actually, uh, oddly enough, knows that too. Until CG becomes utterly convincing as a physical presence, I think physical effects are, will always be better just because they're, they're, they have a presence and, and a solidity to them, which CG as yet can't quite duplicate. I was on the set of a movie that was uh, doing a comic book and they were doing it in motion capture. So, you know, the actors with all the stuff attached to them and doing all this stuff, and you're seeing these cartoon characters you know, respond. So I was talking to the director, and he was saying, he goes, yeah, you see a thing like this. You can really do a, a graphic novel or a comic book exactly the way it was done. Like, if you want to do Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein, you know, you can do it, and every shot will be Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein. And that's never been done before. He goes, well, Sin City kind of did it. You know, almost did it. All right, uh, close to it. And I'm, I didn't contradict him, but I'm thinking, no, Sin City did it exactly what you're talking about. Sin City, especially with the character of Marv, would be the perfect candidate for a motion capture thing. Because it's like, oh, well, who could play that? But we could, if we can just draw that character and have a guy walk through it, then it'll be perfect. Except you wouldn't have that Mickey Rourke performance. So Robert didn't do that. He actually cast an actor and turned him into Marv, and Mickey Rourke was great. And it's why everyone remembers Sin City. As great as it is, it's Mickey Rourke's phenomenal performance that is the thing that like just blew us out of our socks. I was just grazed. You got any beers around this place? I remember when I was reading the, the book again, I just worked with Mickey and I, I read the book to see you know who could play Marv and I was looking at it again and going, oh my God, I know who this person is. Mickey is Marv, but I needed to make him look more like the comic and, and get more of the iconic features. The first thing that was put down was, okay, we don't want him wearing too much stuff because he's got such a great face and such a great voice. So let's try just some minimal stuff. So we did a couple little pieces, just bridge of the nose things, and we did a test and Mickey was here and Robert comes up and all of a sudden Frank Miller walks in behind him. So they're looking at it, they're looking at it, they're looking at it, and I said, well, hey man, you know, here's the wig and there's dentures and, you know, we just, we kept it kind of subtle because we didn't want to go too crazy. So the first shot we did on, it just looked too baby smooth. I was like, even when Mickey takes off the... Mickey has more character in his face when he's got the makeup off than when he does it on. I said, but we can go further if you want. Right. And Frank went, really? We can go further? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, here, this is... <laughs> let me talk to you a minute. So he takes a piece of paper and he does the sketch. <laughs> and he goes, that's Marv. As soon as he did that, I saw how the brow came out and how the nose came out and flattened and then the chin comes in and I was like, I got it. In exactly. Yeah. So we do the makeup and... Um, he got the wife beater and the necklace with the cross and the black duster and walked in the set and Frank Miller literally backed away. 
And then to Frank, up until that point, it had always just been, ah, oh, he's safe, he's on a page, he can't really hurt me. And then you look up and he's walking towards you. And Frank literally was like, we were so lucky because all the actors that we had to do makeups on, Benicio Del Toro and Nick Stahl and Mickey, I mean, these guys were so excited and so into the project. I can't imagine uh, anyone other than Mickey Rourke wearing that Marv makeup. I mean, I, I kind of look at that as the modern day Frankenstein. When I was a kid, Frankenstein was real, the Wolfman was real, the mummy. And that's why they scared the hell out of me. I thought they were real, I mean. It's only after I saw Man of a Thousand Faces, the story of Lon Chaney, that movie was about somebody creating the monsters. I realized, oh, yeah, of course, somebody creates the monsters. I watched this movie and went, wow, this is, this is a real guy, right? My dad's like, yeah, it's Lon Chaney, you know? So he, there happened to be a book out, and he got me the book, and I looked through it, and had all these amazing photos of all these makeups, and just like, that's... You know, that's what the real guy looked like, and this is what all the different characters. Amazing stuff that he came up with. I mean, you know, the Phantom of the Opera makeup with the upturned nose. One of the great makeups of all time is Phantom of the Opera. Fish hooks and, you know, who uh, Lord knows what he put himself through. He would put pieces of wire in his eyes to, to, to pull his eyes down. I mean, talk about a guy who was uh, doing whatever he could for the art of acting in the art of makeup. And, and that really inspired me, you know, and that's where I did start to play with, like, really seeing what I could do as far as changing my face with, with just household <laughs> items. A lot of people, Stan Winston and Tom Savini, all started out wanting to be actors. I wanted to be Lon Chaney when I grew up, so I decided I wanted to be the guy that creates the monsters. Before that, I was a uh, little Italian kid loafing on the corner in Little Italy. And then that, from that day on, I was shining shoes to buy makeup. I went to grade school with half my eyebrows missing, nose putty in my hair. Then I realized I could make up my friends, you know, so I would, you know, burn the top of their heads off with makeup, slice their throats or their wrists, and they would go home and their parents would scream because they're not in makeup mode. They're like, what happened to my kid? Who did that? Savini. Well, you can't play with him anymore. I remember being very impressed with Jack Pierce's work, uh, even before I knew who Jack Pierce was. My mommy and the Wolfman and Frankenstein are... are um, Pretty indelible creations. What's amazing is how iconic those makeups are. Jack Pierce creating a makeup on Karloff that is as classic as the Empire State Building. It's this like deco perfection. There's a reason why that Karloff Pierce universal image is just, you know, and stamped in every, even every kid born today. They've seen that Frankenstein, and that, that's the Frankenstein of their dreams. That's the Frankenstein of their nightmare with the bolts and the flathead. That's the Frankenstein. I mean, Jack Pierce was doing incredible makeups with primitive materials. He would build the makeup every day out of his kit with collodium and cotton. Karloff would sit there for nine and a half hours while Jack would put layers of cotton to build up Karloff's, you know, brows, and then his, build his square head and then put the wig on. From scratch, every day, that was a new creation. There were no rubber pieces to glue on, you know. And one of the reasons Jack Pierce was unceremoniously fired from Universal was that he took too long. And by the 40s, they wanted, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. He was using primitive stuff, but creating our classic monsters. You know? And it all changes with the technology, the ability to make latex pieces that uh, would hold up for the time and to be able to be painted. And it was just, whoop, you know, was something that took three hours, now took 10 minutes. You know, Tom is of the down and dirty school of figuring it out, you know, a lot of, uh, well, you know what, if you just like, I know it'll work, so, bam, you know? And he really was very innovative. He's just got this amazing energy and had a tremendous influence on some of the stuff that we did. I mean, we, I, I could call on Tom to do anything. Romero's movies always held a fascination for me just because there was a kind of, there was a, this kind of slightly um, uh, panic in the 80s about video nasties in the UK, like our censor sort of banned everything. And a lot of good films got, uh, got taken off the shelves. And so Dawn of the Dead was like this legendary movie that everyone talked about. I mean, I, I had never seen a movie before that was just kill after kill after kill after kill, people getting shot in the head and heads explosion. It was this beautiful orgy of on-screen makeup effects. 
I remember the one picture of David Emge in Dawn of the Dead when he's been zombified and he's got a big hole in his neck and he's doing one of the best zombie performances in the, in the history of the genre, I think. And, and looking at it and just thinking, oh my God, what is this? When David Emge is up the elevator shaft and he gets shot and his arm explodes into blood. Well, I don't have an explosives license then, but I wanted to see an explosion of blood come out of him. So, you know, I would just take a condom and split it open, tape it shut, fill it with blood, tie it around David's arm under his clothes. The hole was already in the clothing, and I would have fish line attached to the tape. So when George, and I'm up in the elevator shaft above him, so that when George says, action, I yank that tape, which opens the rubber and blood just went pew. And he was just always coming up with these spontaneous things. It was great. I mean, I could always call Tom up and say, hey, man, we're going to make another one, you know, to start thinking of ways to kill zombies. We all had a day to die, which had nothing to do with the title of the movie, but everybody's death scene, they gave a day to because of the technical. So I was the last death scene. We referenced that specifically in Shaun of the Dead with, uh, with Dylan's character. And it's almost like a Romero staple as well. The evisceration moment. You know, it's what you, you, you wait for. And I love the way that, you know, you totally buy that somebody would just lie there and allow you to tear them in pieces without struggling like crazy. I had already talked to George about having a line. Now I was worried about getting the line up because I, I when I walked in, I said, you know, I don't think Rhodes is gonna is gonna just say nothing when he dies and George goes, well, let's remember they torn your legs off and all you are is a torso. What would you say? And I, I whispered in his ear and I said, Choke on him. Choke on him. Great. Blood is like so, you know, just, and it, it, it was just a mess. But everybody was like, it was a great shot. The shot was great, you know. In particular kudos to Joe for putting up with the stink of those entrails as well, which were famously rotten. I was very fortunate because it's a real memorable death scene. I've known Greg Nicotero since he was 14. He used to come visit the set of Creep Show. We were on draw sketches for us, you know, and uh, invite us to his house. We'd swim in his pool, you know. He was just a great, uh, uh, just, just a fun guy. And we met. Totally coincidentally, this is, Greg was still, I don't know, I can't, I don't remember, maybe 12 or 14, something like that. And they were in Italy vacationing, and I was over there working with Dario Argento. And we're sitting at Alfredo's restaurant in Rome, and we walk in, and, you know, everyone's like, hey, look, there's a Coliseum, you know, there's the Forum, and I'm like, yeah, there's George Romero, I mean, literally, at the next table was George, was George Romero. All of a sudden, this kid comes over to me and says, I'm from Pittsburgh. My name's Greg Nicotero, and I just really love horror movies. And so we chatted a little bit, and I signed an autograph and all that. And he said, can I ever get to do anything like that, do you think? And I said, well, if you really want to, you know, someday. I kept in touch with them. I went and visited the set of Creepshow a lot. I think George Romero and Chris Romero gave him the job on Day of the Dead, you know, some job, and I took him as my assistant. I always acknowledged and thanked George Romero for basically being the guy that opened the doors for me. Every movie I saw, the Friday the 13th, the movies like Happy Birthday to Me and The Prowler, The Prowler was a huge influence. Any movie that I saw that Tom Savini did the makeup on, I would go see. When I wrote my first film, Cabin Fever, I very consciously wrote a makeup effects film. I said, I don't, I don't want a movie that's gonna be about CG. It's about the body deteriorating and we really, have to see it. And when people read the script, they'd say, well, the effects had better be good. Are you going to use CG? And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to use real practical makeup effects. I suppose I thought that, you know, they were just going to slap a bunch of blood on my face and some bruising. And I don't know. I, I thought it would be pretty simple. But, um, you know, they really created wounds. And, you know, you, there, was, there was so much dimension to what they put on my face. The moment where Jordan Lad rolls over and her face is all rotted out right before Ryder Strong smashes her in the head with a shovel, I was really, really pleased with that because we needed her to still be alive and it really looked like her skin had been peeled off. I guess I was sort of an effects virgin before that, but then I kind of got hooked on the experience. I love the blood and uh, I love being covered in blood. 
remember the leg shaving scene? It was supposed to be the skin peeling off like a banana, but in shipping the parts, there was a freeze that happened that we weren't expecting, and a lot of the makeup effects that had been made got frozen. They got destroyed in the freeze. You know, we sat there and we thought, okay, how are we gonna get this? How are we gonna get her to shave her legs with this whole makeup effect that we planned? And we thought, okay, well, what if, you know, we just do the full makeup on it and she's slowly revealing it? And it wound up being so much more effective. And it gets a wild scream every time people see it. That was an improv moment and it became really the centerpiece of the film. This is the guy that created The Exorcist, The Godfather, Midnight Cowboy, The Sentinel. This was the guy, the pioneer. He, he invents all the techniques that all the guys use today. Uh, I knew that in Hollywood, when they did a transformation, they would generally make it out of foam latex, but all in one piece. The problem with that was well, simple. Foam latex shrinks. So when you tried to put it on, you would be fighting the smallness of the mask. And I thought, well, why don't I make it in sections? What Dick was doing was unlike anybody else, you know, just these multi-piece appliances and, and just the way things looked. There's, they just really looked real. It just felt like if you could touch it, it fe would feel like real flesh. There's just something Dick had an eye for, for creating the right form, the right wrinkle over this wrinkle and fold over this fold. Makeup artists wouldn't, didn't share their secrets, you know competition, whatever, but not Dick Smith. You would call Dick Smith on the phone. What? Why? What is it? I'm busy. And you're scared because it's Dick Smith, you know, and then you would ask him a question an hour and a half later. He's still telling you how to do the formulas. And then he would type it up and Xerox it in those days. And mail it to you. He shared his secrets. When I was a kid, when I was six years old, I saw The Exorcist and it traumatized me. I thought it was completely real. I thought you'd get possessed by the devil. The intensity was so great that sitting in the theater, National Theater in Westwood, sitting there, when the lights went down, everybody went, nah, you know, everyone was scared before it started. The Linda makeup, the basic demonic phase, was the toughest one. We did a series of six different makeups right off to test, and um, going crazy, I mean, doing anything. But they wanted to see, you know, every, go whole hog. And there was nothing in the first half dozen that pleased any of us. And so I did another half dozen. But Billy then decided, Billy Friedkin, the director, then decided that, that we should uh, tone it all down, make it as little as possible. And I wasn't too happy about that. And then I think we went into more different tests. And finally, we started coming back in the other direction. The makeup on her was just increasingly startling and weird. I do remember that when she did the vomiting, that a Hispanic woman stood up in the middle of the audience and screaming and said, Dios mío, Dios mío, and she ran up the aisle just screaming. Eileen Dietz did all the vomiting scene. And it was easy to put the makeup on that went Linda wore, and it was a pretty good match. They had to make a vomiting apparatus for the vomiting scene, which was kind of like a, a bit that went in your mouth and had teeny, teeny tubes that ran under the makeup. And of course, I couldn't, I couldn't talk when I heard it. I couldn't talk, and I, you know, I couldn't eat. Um, and he invented like this little vacuum cleaner thing, you know, like when you're in the dentist, the little thing went. <laughs> you know, to get rid of that. We originally thought we'd have to use her a lot because Linda had no training as an actress. And, but she learned very fast. So Linda was used in practically everything except the extreme violence scenes. I did the vomiting scene and the, what they call the abuse of the cross sequence. Fuck Jesus, fuck you! Fuck Jesus, fuck you! <gasps> Which was done to the thighs. If anybody really wants to know. Lift me! Lift me! Oh, bloody sponges on the thighs. <laughs> and of course, you know, the other thing that I always have to say is nobody knew it was going to be the exorcist. We were just working, we were just making a horror film.
we try to duplicate reality. And something Stan Winston said to me as a kid, because I had sculpted this big monster head, he's like, that's all fine and dandy. Sculpt a nose. Why don't you sculpt a nose and mold it and run it and, and apply it and let's see if it looks real. Because if you can do that, you can do anything. And I was like, but that sounds easy. It's just a nose. He went, no, it's not just a nose. It's dead center in your face. So you've got to learn how to crawl before you can walk. There's nothing harder in this life than to convince you that somebody's older than they are on film. Old age makeup is the most diabolically difficult thing to really pull off. It's only ever been done twice, in my estimation, in a way that I completely believed. Both times were Dick Smith. Well, you know, when I saw The Exorcist, which I wasn't allowed to see, but it was one of the films my dad brought home, and I snuck a peek through the crack in the door and watched it. And I kept going, I don't know why people are freaking out about it, because to me, I was looking at it as a technical standpoint. Like, those makeups are amazing. Never did I ever think that Max von Sydow was wearing a, wearing a makeup, you know, as he's playing Father Marin. I seem to recall that he had trouble getting some work after that because everybody thought he was 75 years old. And indeed, he was not. Max was a young man. Max was 40-something when he did The Exorcist. He was a young man. Working with Max, who was in his early 40s somewhere, was really an easy job because he had a, a long, kind of serious-looking face. His skin wrinkled easily enough. I could add on small appliance to give him a wattle on his neck and use just what we call old-age stipples, which is just a latex formulation that you stipple on the skin and stretch it. And then when you let it go, it makes the skin more leathery, and therefore it wrinkles naturally. The approach wasn't that complex in theory. Actually executing it took, took genius. Uh, my own face would be, I, I could look like a mummy in no time. I put some on my face. You know, I don't even think Max von Sydow even looks that old today. It's probably one of the, it is probably the best old age makeup ever done. It's flawless. Uh, and the other one was uh, F. Murray Abraham and Amadeus, which is one of the great makeups of all time. And you just completely believe it. I mean, Dick really became the master of old age makeup. You know, you follow the Father Marin makeup, which to me is perfect, all the way up to Amadeus and so forth, and, and just really, just really beautiful, subtle stuff. His performance was truly wonderful. And that's, that's all part of it. Your makeup is worthless. It's the actor it doesn't use it. Look, he's deserved an Academy Award his whole life. He finally gave it to him for Amadeus. That is a victory for me, and I treasure it still. If they do the Hall of Fame of makeup effects artist, he'll be right at the top of the list. Right, like right next to Jack Pierce would be Dick Smith. I started working in the film business as a mailboy at 20th Century Fox Studios in 1967. And the head of the makeup department at Fox was John Chambers. Johnny once applied to me uh, before he got into this field, uh, for a job at NBC. And at, the, at that point, I had nothing that I could offer him. Johnny headed west and became very successful. He had been a, a guy in the military. One of his jobs was picking up pieces of people um, after accidents and, and acts of war. And he became fascinated by disfigurement and how you deal with it. And he was my first exposure to a makeup artist. I used to go into the makeup department all the time because I thought it was so cool. They had, you know, shelves lined with sculptures and monsters, and they were making all the foam appliances for the Planet of the Apes. Planet of the Apes, beyond your wildest dreams. I'm old enough to remember when Planet of the Apes came out and what an impact that had on my little nine-year-old brain. You did it. You cut up his brain, you funny baboon. Uh, you know, of course, every kid has to do a Planet of the Apes makeup, so I did a whole bunch of those as well. And, you know, got my face, I cast my own face, which was very difficult, <laughs> and uh, ended up sculpting, you know, just, just looking at how they broke it down, you know, those photos. So it was like the brow with the muzzle, and then a lower chin, and then hair pieces, and a hand laid, all this hair. <laughs> I remember the Planet of the Apes being really exciting as a kid because of the 
kind of the idea and seeing the makeup and how strange and adventurous those were. I remember my dad trying to bond my brother and I by saying, oh, let's go, we're going to a you know, college football game. And we're sitting up in the nosebleeds and it was cold and I was all mad because we were missing Planet of the Apes on TV. <laughs> I remember that. Now the tribunal has placed you in my custody for final disposition. You realize what that means? He won an Oscar. He won the second honorary Oscar ever given to a makeup person before it was a category for Planet of the Apes. Rick Baker had a great love for gorillas and was gorilla-obsessed human being. Started with John Landis' schlock and he did King Kong. He always does good gorillas. You're getting soft, Limbo. You normally hack off a limb. Well, I was really excited when, when Rick got hired to do Planet of the Apes, I figured that's oh, going to be great. I mean, I knew Rick's stuff was going to be great. Because of Rick's interest and obsession with apes and, and his inspiration by Planet of the Apes and all that stuff, I think that he always had a really unique vision in terms of how to translate those makeups, saying, how can we improve upon this? How can we make this different? How can we make it more interesting? Well, listen, you know, let's see what we can do about adding lip movement. Uh, I must be out of my mind, out of my mind. I'll have to make it up on volume. What I loved about Rick's makeups were, you know, the makeup he did on Paul Giamatti and the makeup on Tim Roth, and they're, they're all so dramatically different. All right, get them out and get them clean! Chop, chop! It's always tough. I mean, I think Rick took a huge chance doing that film uh, because it has so much love, so, you know, within the world and the audience and all of us. It was astounding work, definitely, you know, a tribute to to Rick's vision and his his sort of updating, you know, the classic. I was working on a picture called Jaws 3 People Zero at Universal, which looked like it was never going to get made. And my friend Mike Fennell was working on a project called The Howling, where the original director was apparently being let go. When I came over uh, to do that picture, um, the idea was that uh, there was going to be a werewolf transformation, and it was all going to be done in one take, which was unusual for the time. Uh, so we went to Rick Baker, who was a friend of ours, and had, you know, was, had always wanted to do a werewolf picture. But uh, he had been working with John Landis on a picture called American Werewolf, and they had never really got the financing and never got off the ground, and I think Rick was a little frustrated. I gave Rick a screenplay I had written in 1969 called An American Werewolf in London. And I said, Rick, figure this out, because I want to show, and I told him everything. And so he had a long time to think about it, because no one would ever make that film. And so when we asked him to do our picture, he said, sure. And he had all these ideas, which I guess he had been planning to use on the other picture. And he worked for us for about, um, I don't know, a week, maybe. And he did a fabulous test. And John's project suddenly came to life. I call him up, and I go, hey, Rick, I got the money. We're making Werewolf. And he went, oh, hmm. What's the matter? He says, well, remember that change o head I showed you and everything? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm doing a werewolf picture for Joe Dante. <laughs> he said, you fuck, what, you, what? So Rick had to um, semi-reluctantly leave our movie and um, left us in the hands of Rob Boutin, who was his associate, was much younger, uh, had worked with me on Piranha at the age of 18, so I already knew him. So uh, Rob Botine took over the picture and finished and did the werewolves, and Rick came and, and did an American Werewolf in London. Rick Baker's American Werewolf in London. When you watch that, it's happening right in front of you. My stuff always was happening right in front of you. There was something to that. Rob came up with his own concept of, of you know how he wanted to do these transformations i had done a movie called airplane where i uh made a uh a mechanical nose prosthetic for leslie nielsen it was like a pinocchio nose and it grew on camera you know so i thought well wait a minute what if i use the same technology that i used for that nose and i used it to actually make the mechanical mask uh, uh make its nose grow and make the make the lower jaw grow make the ears grow and make the teeth grow. With the inspiration that uh, Joe Dante wanted to see uh, transformation done in, in one shot, 
uh, I then started thinking like, well, wouldn't it be kind of interesting to actually make a, a replica of the actor? And inside would be like a, an underskull. And um, uh, I thought, well, what if I, I actually uh, took the skull and, and uh, cut it up and actually uh, got the bones to shift and whatnot? It was a learn by doing situation. Rob would do stuff, we would shoot it, we would look at it, we would cut it, uh, we would discover that um, what looked like a mistake was actually could work for us if we put a sound effect on it. Rob Oteen was just, he was really unbelievable on the howling. Dee Wallace, who had to do most of the reacting to the werewolf uh, and had to look at nothing, uh, was a really good actress who could really get into the moment. And you find that uh, no matter how good your effects are, uh, if your cutaway to the actor's response isn't convincing, it negates the quality of the effect. It was interesting hearing Joe going, okay, he's getting taller. Whoops, there comes his ears. They know that there's a level of risibility to the fact that you're doing it, so they have to take that into account and, and not break up. Well, I love Rob Bottin. Rob Bottin, God, you know what it's like. It's like um, when a movie would come out by Rob Bottin or Rick Baker or Dick Smith, this is the latest exhibit from your favorite artist. That's how I would treat it. You're not going to just see this movie. You're going to see the latest artwork from one of these people. I mean, look at Total Recall, the woman's head that just split, boom, 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 and there's Arnold. When I was meeting with Paul and I was pitching him uh, my different ideas for the movie, this is the transition scene where, where Arnold, in essence, is going to Mars and his adventure is beginning. That wasn't in the script. You know, that, was, that wasn't written somewhere. He just contributed that. Get ready for a surprise. That's the stuff that you respect. I talked with a bunch of guys on the thing about how to do it. There was a lot of influence uh, at the time from Alien, face-hugging and, and such. Rob Oteen came in and said, kind of gave me the secret to the movie, uh, creatively, dramatically, and, and the effects-wise. He said, look, this is a chance of a lifetime because the thing can look like anything. It doesn't have to look like one thing. It changes constantly. So we can just go wild with it. So I said to John, wouldn't it be neat if the guy's rib cage, Norris, his rib cage just rips open and his ribs become like a big set of teeth? And then Doc, who isn't expecting this, of course, falls in to the, uh, uh, the, the chest cavity and the teeth close and bite Doc's arms off. One of my favorite images of all time is, you know, Norris's head hitting the floor and sprouting the legs. And... Are you kidding me? <laughs> I remember when I first saw The Thing, I went into a double feature of The Thing in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and I thought if Fast Times was first, and then it was gonna go into The Thing. And they had the times all screwed up, so when you got there, this guy's head was coming off the table. <laughs> stretching and then crawling across the floor. Like, that ain't fast time. You know, you felt like you were in the hands of lunatics who would stop at nothing to get the visceral effect. Now that is the masterpiece of splatter to me, the thing. Nothing I've ever done I could say this is the masterpiece of splatter. Although they call me the king of splatter, Rob Bottin's work in the thing was the, that's, that's the masterpiece. And what really is mind blowing is those effects still hold up. We got a call out of the blue from Kevin Costner's company, and he was going to do this Western called Dancing with Wolves. First one he was going to direct. So he called us in, and he said, well, listen, I saw the cadavers you did for Gross Anatomy, so if you can do dead bodies, you can definitely do dead buffaloes. Obviously, it, it's illegal to, to shoot and kill animals for motion pictures, and, and they had some very specific things they wanted to do. We needed to make two mechanical buffaloes for a buffalo hunt to simulate the actual arrows and, and bullet hits that are going into the buffalo hides. Then there were the other buffaloes, I want to say 23 buffaloes, and they were made so that their hides were removable. During the construction, I got a phone call from the production designer. And he said, we're using actual buffalo hides here, and we understand you're using artificial fur. And I said, well, of course we're using artificial fur. It's, you know, we don't want to use actual animal hides in making these things. And, you know, working with the skins and all that stuff would be very difficult for us, and this will be easy. He said, well, it's never going to match. It's never going to match. In a million years, enough. I said, well, trust me, 
So I'm going to do a great job. It's going to look nice. You'll see. Ah, I don't believe you. So I said, well, send me a buffalo hide, and I'll shoot pictures side by side. So the buffalo hide came in, and the artificial fur came in. I looked at the two, and I went, okay. And took and I used some, uh, some uh, fabric paints and things that we use, and I made it, you know, painted them about the same, and I looked at them, and I was about to put the labels on, and I went, huh, and I reversed them. I took a picture, and I sent it to the production designer. Well, I got a call. Oh, my God. That artificial buffalo fur looks terrible. It's not real. It's awful. as this and that and the other thing. I said, I knew you were going to say that. I switched the tags. And there was silence on the other end of the phone. And I said, I'll see you out in South Dakota when we're ready to go. And that was that. And never had another problem with it. Through a friend of mine, Scotty Spiegel, who's one of the co-writers on uh, uh, Evil Dead 2, I met the KMB guys, which was uh, Greg Nicotero and Bob Kurtzman and Howard Berger. And we got to be friends. And we'd all go see movies at, like, the New Art, you know, and go see The Killer, I remember, and standing around with Quentin, and then afterwards we'd all go out and eat and all this. So anyhow, we knew that Quentin was a writer, and uh, Bob Kurtzman had this idea for this vampire gangster movie and had written a 25-page outline but wanted to have a real writer do, write, write the script. So he thought, hey, I can, I can probably pay Quentin to do this. This would be great. And uh, I said, okay, I'll do it for $1,500, and I'll do all that stuff, and I was happy to do that. But I, but I threw a provision in there. And I said, look, I'm going to be making Reservoir Dogs coming up in this next year and a half, and I want you to do the makeup effects on it for free. And, uh, and Bob said, okay. So he wrote From Dust Till Dawn for Bob, and Bob tried to get it going for quite a while. Nobody liked it. Everyone was saying, you can't go from having this gangster movie to this vampire movie. And it's, you know, it's, it's two different movies. This is crazy. Who would ever make a film that's two films in one? That doesn't make any sense. It'll never happen. Quentin gave me a script to read. Um, he said, um, here's something you can do in Mexico. It's something that I first wrote. I don't have the rights to it anymore. but." Uh, check it out and I started reading it and it was terrific but like there's stuff that he'd already taken out of it like uh, the Ezekiel speech from Pulp Fiction was in that originally and there's other gems that he had already been pulling out and I thought you know a few more years there won't be anything left if you keep mining it you know, we better go shoot it quick while we can and then the next thing you know the movie was being made because of a, a strike that was going on because we were non-union actually uh, we had to shoot the second half first so KNB had to make all of the effects all the creatures and everything right away so that we could start with all that. You know, you would think you would shoot it out of order. I mean, shoot it in order so that you could have time to prepare all of that. And shoot all your outdoor stuff first. But we had to start with the interior crew stuff before we could go out and shoot the exterior stuff. So the whole second half was done first. So first day was in the bar, and by the first end of the first week, we were into vampires and creatures and all of that. It was so much fun. It was like literally... You're talking about a bunch of guys that show up to work. There's a bunch of naked girls and blood and vampires and Quentin Tarantino and Harvey Keitel and Robert Rodriguez. We were shooting downtown in, in an old uh, Laurie's uh, se meat seasoning factory that had been closed down. And uh, it was hot as hell. This was during the, the summer. Uh, no air conditioning. We were all dying. So we, were, we had a room that was actually like the meat locker that was off from the, uh, the sound stage where I set up the makeup room. So there are 12 of us, and they're doing hundreds of makeups all day long, just churning, churning, churning. Uh, you know, my makeup took about three hours. And it was great getting the makeup on, you know, and getting the long finger. I love the long fingers, you know. And after the makeup's on, an hour after it's on, I'm running around the hallway, scaring people, sneaking up behind Rodriguez, you know. And they, they pretty, Greg purposely gave me a penis nose. Look at my makeup and dust will go on. It's a penis nose because he's my friend and I. <laughs> and it's in there, and every time we look at the picture, he's like, why, why, why did you do this? Up until that point, we had done little things for, for Quentin, you know? Nothing big. Like, Reservoir Dogs, a great movie. But for us, there was this ear chop thing, which is rather memorable, and a lot of blood stuff. But we really got to prove ourselves to him on, on that show. And then it just kind of led into the next shows. And, you know, the next gigantic, enormous thing we did with Quentin was obviously Kill Bill, where. I think we proved ourselves for a lifetime with him. I wanted to have the Japanese type of pyrotechnics, with like the way the blood was squirted out and all that kind of stuff. I didn't want it to have that horror movie stuff. 
Even as far as like um, the color of the blood, we tested all these different bloods. We tested Chinese blood, uh, what they use in uh, Hong Kong and China for bloody scenes. We tested Japanese blood uh, for what they use in their movies, and we tested American blood. And so we went with the Japanese blood. It was great working with uh, Howard Berger, and he knew exactly what it is I wanted. And, um, and, you know, and he's great because there's no excuses, you know, because there are things that don't work. You know, that's, they don't work half the time, actually, but he never has an excuse about it. It's just, okay, sorry, we're all waiting. Here we go. Try it again. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. Give me five minutes to figure it out. In the last dozen years, we've done every one of Robert's films. Grindhouse was the most fun I've ever had on a film, for sure. We had a blast. You it was fun just being there. I mean, just being there. One, because of Robert. I was trying to think what kind of zombies they'd be. It made sense that they would just be sort of an infection brought back from the war, that it would be a viral infection. And I had my doctor show me real infections so I could kind of see how could you mix some of these together and have them get out of control. And he said, oh, well, I've got eyeballs, Iraqi eyeballs, and actually in my refrigerator, you know, mustard gas makes them all cloudy. <laughs> my doctor's kind of out there. I put him in the movie. My doctor is the doctor in the movie that's there with Josh Brolin. And I was just like, oh, these are, these are horrible. So I thought, well, let's just take these and multiply them and have them all happen at a very rapid rate. It was no holds barred, you know? I mean, that's what Robert wanted, was everything goes, anything goes. And everybody's pretty serious about it. Except when you actually get out on the set and you start doing your thing and, you know, the pus pack, you know, they start bursting. They love it, man. They're like little kids. It was uh, months of doing the disease makeups on the actors, plus all of the effects that we had in the film. That was a lot for the money and the time that we had. Basically because it was a double feature. Had to save money on mine so that there'd be enough money for Quentin to make his. It was funny because, you know, Robert uses a lot of uh, CGI in his stuff, and so and I had never really used CGI before, except maybe to race a wire or two. So then I wrote a car crash and go, hey, if I'm going to use CGI, I'm going to do some shit I've never seen before. So I thought I would, you know, do this car crash where people are getting torn apart simultaneously. It. Now, Greg knows I can't stand CGI, so he just assumed that he was going to have to build this. And then when he started talking like that, I, you know, all of a sudden, yeah, let's do it in camera. Forget, yeah, I didn't tell him I was thinking about CGI. I was like, yeah, he, he's right. He actually thinks, uh, okay, let's do that. Let's do it that way. The real challenge was we had to create dummies of each of these girls that could act. Because the idea always was, Quentin said, I want, this is like a crash test dummy movie. I want to see all this stuff in super slow motion. So we did body scans and live casts of four principal actresses who were in the car at the time of the crash. I, I can't believe they have this technology, but they, get, they got me to get into a circle and make a Da Vinci pose. This round unit comes around you, slowly drops around you, you can't move for 60 seconds. You have to hold this position, and it takes this perfect image of your body. What uh, Quentin wanted was very specific stuff, you know, to see a, a car tire ripped through the roof of the car and peel a girl's face off, and to, you know, the girl gets her leg ripped off as she goes flying out of the front window of the car and, and things like that. There were very specific things, so the actresses had to be cast in the exact positions they were sitting in in the car. But then the armatures inside had to be articulated in such a way, too, that they moved like a real human body would move. So we literally designed armatures that mimicked the human body in terms of the skeleton. You know, we had joints that could only move a certain way. If your arm can't bend this way, then the armatures and the, and the puppets didn't bend that way. So we built everything so that it was all loose. We did full silicone bodies. They made these things look exactly like us. We shot for three days, pulling the bodies apart and ripping the leg off and shooting the dummies through the windshield. And the last gag was the shot where Vanessa's sitting in the back seat. She's the only one that sees the crash coming. So she closes her eyes. So as the wheel comes through and rips through, it rips her face off.
that's one of the things I'm real proud about it is, you know, it's all done in camera. The dummies look really good and you, you can't tell and uh, I'm pretty proud of that. But that was all shot on the day. Nothing was added. Nothing was taken away. That's just, you know, we shot it on the set that way. I like going to conventions where you'll have a young kid that will come up and say, oh man, I loved Evil Dead 2 and I'm a big fan of the Romero movies. And, and you look at them and you go, wow, that was me one day. And they're influenced by movies and sequences that we've had a part in doing. I mean, to me, that's so exciting to be able to influence young filmmakers and young minds. It's that magic of movies, however that, however that is defined. It's part of the magic that makes you want to do it, you know, when you're a kid and makes you pursue it as an adult. These guys love what they do. Any job on a movie is hard work and long hours, but makeup effects guys are constantly working a lot longer than the shooting company is working. Your inspirations come from everything. All the great old movies, you know, all the great old comic books, and then uh, uh, a good healthy dose of nightmares. My generation and, you know, generations before us know who Lon Chaney is, who know all these great makeup artists, Jack Pierce, Cecil Hall, and they're the basis of why we do this. I am all for, you know, the uh, growth of young people, and if I've been able to, I've helped them a little bit sometimes. There are a number uh, of makeup artists that have grown up with kind of second generation people, and they have become really better and better until they're now top artists. And uh, that I regard as terrific.